Um, although, working with somebody like uh, Paul Mazursky, who wrote his own scripts, um, Paul was a lot more flexible. He let the actors uh, change things as long as they were within keeping with what he was writing. Uh, Sidney, of course, wasn't writing his own scripts at that, I mean, in, in, in this instance anyway, so he was dealing with a very highly respected writer. Um, Mel so Brooks. The, uh, the mad as hell scene? Yes. Oh, oh, no, no. And the mad as hell scene was one of the, one of the great experiences of, of my limited career as an AD. I'll tell you what happened, too, because the way I got onto that movie, I was a second assistant director. I had worked my way up. And, and you have to have a certain number of days as a second AD. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the, the way the training program works, you go through the training program and you, you accumulate days on projects. When you accumulate, it used to be 400 days, they said. If you got 400 days of work, which usually took two years of pretty solid work, you would then be allowed to become a second AD your pay scale would, of course, I mean, as a, as, a, as a trainee, you were getting about $150 a week. As a second assistant, you'd get $400 a week. So it was a big jump. But you were then a real member of the crew. You weren't just a, a you know, a gopher. You were doing something more than that. So um, I had been the second AD. I'd worked my days up. The first AD on network was a famous first AD named Pete Scapa. Everybody knew him in New York. He had done tons of really major, major movies with all the all the biggest movies in New York. He was one. He certainly was one of the one or two top ads in New York. But Pete was old, or older at the time, and he was. I'm not exactly sure. I think he got sick and um, and had to leave the picture, and and he actually left the picture and retired. And moved to Florida. I mean, that was the last movie he did. But Sidney was looking for somebody to replace him. I was one of a number of seconds, second ADs, and I was given the shot to, to step up and become the first. And I had enough days to do it. So I became the first AD. What was unusual about Sidney was that a lot of the things that a sec that a first AD would normally do for example, set the background action, meaning that everything other than the principles you set up. So the extras are walking. Extras are walking. You things. deal with the crosses. You yeah. decide. You tell them. You you the director is uh, according to the director's guild. Director is not even allowed to talk to them other than really? generally. Not allowed to make specific notations. Uh, I mean. But you can like go on a loudspeaker and yeah, say, say yeah, I mean, yeah, he can say that, but he can't really, he's not supposed to direct specific action, really. Sidney didn't pay all that much attention to what anybody said. I mean, in that respect, he was very, uh, he did what he needed. And in this particular case, I'll give you an example of it, which was absolutely mind-blowing. We were in Elaine's uh, restaurant in New York, and we had a scene with uh, Faye Dunaway and William Holden. And they're sitting at a table and they're having a conversation. And Sidney would come in and he'd tell everyone to leave the set and he'd do a rehearsal, spend 20 minutes working with them. He had probably previously rehearsed in a rehearsal room somewhere else, but now he's on the location, he's rehearsing with them. Um, then when he's finished with the rehearsal and he feels comfortable about it, he would bring his DP, his director of photography and his lighting designer in, and perhaps the prop people, but just the keys and they'd stand around and he'd show them the rehearsal. So we'd have Faye and, and uh, Holden do their dialogue and do their movements and stand or not or whatever, move, side, whatever. And he would, uh, he would let the lighting designer look at it and figure out, okay, uh, I got to put some light here, you know, fig figure out what they were going to do. Um, then he would let the principal actors leave the set. And then he would say to me, because I'm the assistant director, he says, okay, let's, let's bring the extras in. So, the, I mean, we call them extras. I mean, you know, the background, uh, I mean, it became background soon after that because extra was considered a negative pejorative comment. No one wanted to be called an extra, so, although they still call them extras, but the idea was the, the background actors, okay. So the background actors came in and there may be 50 of them, okay? And they all kind of come in, and it's a whole restaurant. You've got people sitting, you've got waiters, 
you've got people coming to a table and a way to bringing them, you've got all kinds of potential situations. Normally the situation would be something that the AD, me, would, would choreograph. So I would do the action. Sydney, of course, would look at it, or uh, not Sydney, but any, any director would look at it and they'd say, okay, uh, looks good, but you change that. Don't have that guy over there because he's right in the middle of the eye line for the actor. I'd rather he moved over here, you know, whatever. Okay, fine. You know, and you make adjustments. Then when, when the lighting is ready and everything's ready and he brings the principal actors back in, after they're all ready, he then brings in the background, set has them all set which is something i do usually with i'm i'm right by the director as a first ad my assistant director is with the people making sure they're in their seats and everything's going along and he's following my instructions and i have he usually has an earphone and i'm talking to him directly saying okay get those two people over here you know whatever it is so that i mean that's the normal way it works anyway with sydney and this was, you know, it blew, totally blew my mind. Um, when everybody came in the room, the 50 people, he said, um, okay, could you just, just go around the room? Just, just tell me your names, you know, first names. So the first guy say, I'm Fred, I'm Helen, I'm Bob, I'm George, I'm, Dun-, you know, and, and they'd all just, you know, and they just like that. I mean, he'd go all the way around the room. He said, okay, thank you all. Please go sit down. We'll call you back when we're ready to work with you. He usually would do that even before the rehearsal with the two principals, okay? So now, now he's rehearsed the principals. He's got the basic lighting all, all in, and he would say to me, okay, bring, bring all of the background people in. I was ready to start giving people crosses, telling them where to sit. Sydney said, he says, no, no, I'll, I'll, just let, me, let me do it. So I said, okay. But instead of, I mean, and, and my normal instinct would be to say, okay, you two over there, the one in the red dress, you, you sit over at that table. You're a couple. I'd like you at that table over there. Um, and you're just beginning your meal. Uh, you four people are a group, and the waiter is going to take you over to your table over here, and then that's where you're going to sit. Because I know that there's going to be wide shots that are going to show all this background, although the focus of the scene is just these two people talking, but it has to look like a busy restaurant. So Sydney, Sydney would say, um, <clears throat> he'd say, okay, uh, Helen, why don't you walk across this way? George, why don't, he remembered everybody's name. I'm talking about 50 people. I mean, he had a photographic memory. Yeah. It totally flipped me out. I mean, I, I, yeah, and this was my... because as a director, this there's is, so many things to worry about. So many about. things to worry about. You think, how could he possibly? But he just was, he was so on top of what he was doing, and he had a photographic memory that it was, it, you know, it was pretty mind-boggling. Another thing that a director uses as a not as a crutch, but as a, as a major aid, is your script supervisor. Script supervisor is the person who is sitting with the script, writing down everything that happened, so that if, if we're doing the scene and the two main actors are talking and they make a mistake and in the dialogue, and, and it's a two-shot, it's the two of them, and the director doesn't want to go back to the beginning and start all over again, where everyone has to go back to the beginning too, all the extras, that individual has to know, well, who was just behind him at the point that he said that line so that we can have them there? Where was his drink? Was he drinking or was it on the table? Was it here? Was it there? Did they move the body, the bottle? I mean, all these little technical details. Some directors are extremely careful about that stuff and want to make sure because if if the movie is if the movie is cut in such a way that you go from a a two shot to a closer single and the bottle that was there moves over here it's going to you know somebody's going to notice i mean most people don't notice but it, you know obviously there are books written about all the goofs in movies and a lot of those goofs are those kinds of things you know oh did you notice there was no bottle in the second take and it wasn't a, you know well if you're looking at i mean some directors will say look if they're looking at the bottle they're missing the point of the scene i'm not worried about that we'll you know so 
it, it depends on the nature of the individual director. But the truth is, the job of that script supervisor is to make sure that the dialogue is done right, that the performance is correct, that, you know, is watching everything. And most of it is so that editorially, when, when all of the notes that the script supervisor makes wind up going to the editor, and the, the editor then knows, oh, and that take, the bottle was in the wrong place. Well, I can still use that take if I only use it up to that point. So, you know, I mean, it, it helps the editor to, to be able to help design the editorial aspect of the movie, and it helps the director because he's, his mind is constantly refreshed by information that he may not be paying attention to. Because he has, he's paying attention to the performance, he may not be paying attention to the hat or the, you know, or, or the collar that was up in the last take and seems to have fallen down, that's not going to cut between each other. So we've got to be careful about it. So that, that's, yeah, and whenever that happens, the script supervisor will say, well, wait, his collar was down in this take. Maybe we want to do another one. Okay, so they put his collar back up. They do another take. And maybe another 10 takes until they get it back to the way they had it. And then, the, then everything's fine. But I mean, it's it's all part of the process. Anyway, as an AD, I was I was organizing uh, stuff with Sydney when we did. There were there were three scenes, uh, uh, particular scenes of I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And I took it upon myself, realizing how he was by the time we got to do that. I was already working with him for a couple of weeks. I. I knew how detail-oriented he was. So, and this is before cell phones. This is, you gotta remember, this is, we had walkie-talkies. There were big walkie-talkies. We had smaller ones. They weren't as good. The bigger ones were a little, you know, have a little more range. And we were on, I think, 6th Avenue and 56th Street, and there was a big building there. And this was one of the places where people were going to pop out of windows saying, I'm mad as hell, and I'm, you know, he, after he's done it, each one of them is going to come out of a different window. And it was supposed to be a kind of a random pattern. So uh, I arranged with, the elect, with one of the electricians to wire lights in, in the windows where people were going to come out of so that we had a, a board where we could press a light and have a person so that it wouldn't be three people from the same floor. You could have one from that floor. You know, we could do a random kind of a, a, a thing. And working that out was, I had a great deal of fun doing it. And Sydney, uh, because I had this panel in front of me, Sydney could just say, I like somebody over there. Okay, boom. I, and that person would pop out. I didn't have to call out. They knew because we had, had set up a, a grid to be able to let them do that. I mean, it, what I'm saying to you is not terribly unusual. ADs do stuff like this all the time. But at that time, for Sydney, I really wanted to prove that I could keep up with him <laughs> because he was so incredibly fast. We did other uh, scenes with um, Peter Finch where he it was just him sticking his head out a window and saying it, and that would be on, you know, we, so, it was an extraordinary experience, and most entire the entire movie was shot in New York City, just at um, I, I'm not sure. It might have been it was one of the networks let us use their building and their offices, um, and it was another situation with a guy like Sidney. Sidney could work within a real environment better than most directors. Most directors would have. Uh, the distractions in a real environment would have been something that would have required them to build a set. He, he could work in a real environment as good as anybody. And so we didn't really, I mean, we had some sets, but they weren't uh, any, you know, the huge things that you would have to pay a lot of money for. Good example of that would be a movie like uh, um, All the President's Men. I mean, everything that, that took place. Everything was built in yeah. Warner's lot. I mean, they used all the paper and all the crap from the real location. They just took bales of stuff from the Washington Post and sent it to California to make it look as real as they could. But it was done on a stage because you had total control. You could have it day, night, day, night, light, 
you know, light outside, no, you know. Whereas if you're shooting in a real environment and you're on the 10th floor of a building and you got a black in the windows and you have to do it from the outside because you can't see it so that there's, no, so it's night. Uh, and then you can't see any, any lights on in buildings outside because unless you build a, some kind of a, a tent over it and have little mini lights in it, it's a nightmare. I mean, it really is. So there are, there are times when in the course of filming you have to make the decision now this is something we we probably ought to do in, with a set Sidney again was rather unique in the fact that he didn't do that now I mean he was he, he was it was a great thrill to work with him I mean I, I didn't I didn't get to work with him that long I only worked with him on uh, I would say a, a third of the movie but everything that he did was uh, was some, was a learning experience for me, and very different than the way I work with Paul Mazursky. When I was Paul's AD, I did um, I did all the background action. We we did next stop Greenwich Village. We were in a hospital. I had to have gurneys and people and crosses and all kinds of stuff. And I would set up all of that, and he would deal with the front action. Again, he was a guy who unusually. In, in this sense, when you would go location scouting with him, he would walk the locations with his crew, with his key people, and he would make decisions about what he was going to shoot. And he says, okay, I'm only going to be looking in this direction. I'm never going to look back that way. So you can put all the trucks back there. It's fine. You know, so he was very conscious he of knew, production. And he was always conscious of production. So he would, he would, we'd go out on a street, We'd be on Cornelia Street in Greenwich Village, and you say, okay, we're going to look that way only. We're going to look this way, this way. So we're going to see 180 degrees, but anything this way, we will never look that way. So you never have to worry about me changing my mind and turning around where I have to move everything in the world. So you can put your caravans and your, your, your trailers and stuff like that back there. And he would do that in each location. He'd say, okay, this one, we're going to do a rain scene. We're going to put towers over these two buildings. Uh, but we're going to be shooting from this side of the street, not that side of the, you know. He was extremely efficient once he worked it out. He worked it out on the location without his actors but with his crew but he knew he he was an actor himself and he was very confident that he could get the actors to be where he wanted them to be as opposed to some directors who were afraid you know they will say well let the actors just do what they're going to do and then we'll figure out how to how to cover it he didn't he didn't work that way he 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 had a pretty good i mean he did he was improvisational within scenes, but not in terms of the blocking. He knew the blocking he wanted. He knew where he wanted people to go, and he organized his scouts to make sure that everything worked that way. As a result, you wind up having uh, a very efficient set. Everything was, you know, he'd get there in the morning. The trucks would be where he told us eight weeks ago, and that's where we'd put them, and he was fine with that and he never had a problem and everything was you know everything went according to his plan uh, then it was just a function of whether the actors were fine if there was a problem with an actor if there was a problem with somebody was sick or he couldn't shoot a certain piece of the scene but other than that he was he was very 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 well organized and I did uh, two movies with him I, I worked on Harry and Tonto and I worked on Next Stop Greenwich Village. They were early in his career. They were both New York movies. They were both 40-day movies, pretty much. For five week, uh, six week, uh, excuse me, eight weeks. Eight five-day weeks. He never wanted to work on the weekends. He needed the weekends to rethink what he was gonna do next week and have some time off. And he used 99% uh, of his crew came from New York after his first movie. His first movie, he, he brought a cameraman in from California, but that was the uh, and that was Harry and Tonto, and but it was also the fact that that movie was only starting in New York, and a good portion of the movie was the trip across the United States, and I was not involved in that part of the movie. I was only involved in the New York section because I lived in New York, and they hired a California AD for the rest of the shoot, which was upsetting to me, because I wanted you know. My feeling was I wanted to be in a movie from the beginning to the end, whatever it was. Yeah. But economic considerations, they would have had to put me up. And uh, maybe a local 
hire. It was easy for me to be a local hire and and slightly cheaper, not 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 much. Most everybody got paid scale, and scale was not bad. It was, as I said, for a second ID, four hundred dollars for a first ID. I don't know, a thousand, whatever, twelve hundred, maybe not. I don't know, whatever whatever the number was. But it was a reasonable amount of money to earn while you were working. I mean, the big problem for all of us was that what was going to happen after the job, you know, were you going to work again? What was the next movie? And New York at the time when I was working in New York was not uh, the most popular location. I mean, it was, a, it was always a popular location because of its, um, because of the visuals in New York, but it was also considered to be much more expensive than working in LA. The unions were, were more difficult. The costs were higher. Um, if you worked at night, you had to pay night premiums, which meant that um, if you started at if you started at eight in the morning, nine in the morning, ten in the morning, you get you had an eight hour day and then time and a half for two hours and then double time after you know and then triple time after fifteen hours. So if you worked that long, you were paying people triple their their hourly rate which nobody wanted to do, quite frankly. I mean, unless it was absolutely critically essential. And I mean, if you had to get the scene, there was no other way to do it. You couldn't do it on another day. Yeah, they did, triple time happened, you know. I mean, it was, it's still cheaper than the cost of the actors, than the cost of other things. You're talking about the crew, they would, you know, it would happen. ADs didn't get, didn't get premiums. We, we were a flat, deal for a day and at a certain point in the in the 70s it was it no maybe it was in the 60s uh no no i'm sorry it was in the 70s the dga the directors guild made a rule saying that if you worked 16 hours you would get paid a double day and if you worked 21 hours you would get paid a triple day well, anyone who works 21 hours in a 24-hour day is really going to be worthless at the end of 21 hours anyway. So, I mean, the opportunities for people to work that long were pretty rare. But double days did happen. You know, 16-hour days, 17-hour days did happen. And especially with ADs because you were the first people there and the last people to leave. So that ev uh, everybody... Uh, was off by the time you leave because you had to you had to set everything up. You had to make sure the trucks were there. You had to make sure everything was cleaned up after it was over. So um, not the first AD usually. The first AD, the job of the first AD is from the time the director arrives till the time the director leaves. The second ADs were the ones that were being paid less, and they could be there for 18 hours. So a double day for a second AD. You got eight hundred dollars instead of four hundred dollars. It was great for you for the time, but nobody liked the idea. And of course, all of this changed in the in the eighties and nineties when people were being killed on on movie sets because was, uh, driving home. Well, yeah. you know, no, I mean, somebody would drive home after having worked eighteen hours and go off the road, and it became uh, uh, safety became a much much bigger concern. And all of the unions said, wait a minute, you know, we can't work these hours. It's not, you know, it's, it's crazy. Because uh, in my own career, I had an opportunity to work in Europe and in, in lots of other places. And the one thing I've learned about the way Americans work as opposed to Europeans work is that if you shoot an eight-hour day in London and you want to shoot 10 hours or 12 hours because you can't get the scene done in time, uh, you you have to ask the shop steward from the union for permission and if he likes you and he understands what your problem is he's very likely to give you permission but he doesn't have to in our country we always felt that as long as we're paying you we own you and it, we, you don't have any right to say you don't want to work if i say i need you for 21 hours you're going to be here 21 i'm going to pay you a fortune way more than i should or or well not way more than i should but but ridiculous money but as long as i'm paying you that money i got you and you can't leave i mean i think 
personally, and as I became a producer, I thought that was a terrible idea. And I am, is you know, as strong for safety and shorter hours as anybody. I mean, I think 12 hours is as long as anybody should ever work in a in a shooting day. And if you can't get the work in 12 hours, the value of the work diminishes so greatly after that amount of time anyway that you'd be better off working a new a whole other day in a shorter period of time to get uh, you know to get a more efficient work out of the people on every set before every anything that could be even slightly dangerous on a on a movie uh, the, D the directors guild has required that that the first ad call a safety meeting and get everybody who's involved together and everybody else who is not involved also together so that they know where they can't be, where they have to be, what's happening, uh, so that there's no surprises. And, and I mean, some of it probably came out of the Twilight Zone uh, disaster. Uh, I mean, a lot of stronger uh, union concern over things that were illegally done but a lot of it also just came out of the very fact that it was usually camera people because they work tremendously late. They're still loading the cameras after, I mean, loading the magazines after everyone leaves. They got to sometimes go to the lab. And it just, uh, you had a number of camera assistants that uh, were in car accidents and other things that happened. And, uh, and so the IA created rules, the DGA created rules. SAG has always had a, a pretty good rule in that there is a 12-hour uh, day and between the time you finish and the time you work the next day has to be 12. You need a 12-hour break, whereas uh, the only other union that had a break that I know of in the, in the 70s and 80s was the camera, cameraman. The director of photography had a 10-hour turnaround meaning he, you had to give him 10 hours from the time you finished with him till he could be back on the set the next day. But ADs, we could be back on the set in four hours. You know, I mean, they didn't, you know, if we finished at t the two in the morning and they wanted us back at six, we had to be back, you know, and uh, that's crazy. So they, they've now instituted, uh, I think all the unions now have at least an eight-hour turnaround. Um, and to me, that's... That's humane. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, at least you can get to sleep, you know, hopefully. In the meetings with the Directors Guild and other places where we've been asked about those things, that the, the level of efficiency falls off so greatly anyway that you're not saving anything by trying to jam it all in in, in, in overtime. The bigger problem with it isn't really about the fact that you get better work. It's about that you have uh, dates that you're trying to meet so that like a television show will work 18 hours because they got to finish in seven days because it's going to be on the air next week. So they don't have time to take the extra time sometimes. And so you see a lot more abuse of hours on a lot of episodic television shows because of the need to to meet a date as opposed to just get the best job done. Yeah. So it happens.